Way, hi. How are you, Ross? Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, sir. Welcome to the Desert Island. Thank you very much. How's life? On very the desert well. island for you. Very good, very good, thank you. Nice bright day. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce my new co-host, Wilson. Do you remember Wilson from the original yeah, Castaway? It's funny, I, I had a colleague that reminds me a lot of Wilson, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, many years ago. He was, uh, he, he was on our US team. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> okay, that's, that's maybe that's um, after Island Drinks talk. Indeed, indeed. I have to say, I really love uh, your island livery. That's a beautiful shirt you have on, sir. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I wear it for, for all these um, special events that I host here, and uh, it's become my lucky island shirt. Fantastic. Well, I hope it brings you good fortune. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, um, I'm just going to take a quick swig of my special island cocktail. Did you manage to bring a drink with you, Wei? Fantastic. So, um, I hope you've managed to pack some watches to share with us um, here on the island today. Um, you know, Ross, I'm so pleased that you invited me for this because it, gets, uh, it allows me to sort of unite two of my passions. One is my passion for desert island watches, which in particular are Rolexes, um, as I feel that those are the most reliable watches in the world. The type of watch you could um, end up on a desert island and you could use it to bash open clamshells or smash open coconuts and put it back on your wrist and it'd still be keeping immaculate time. Uh, and I've managed to unite that with my passion for floral or Hawaiian shirts. Um, so today, actually, I've uh, hoped to um, impress upon you, not just with my uh, Rolex collection, uh, but also with my Desert Island shirt collection. So I have a series of different Hawaiian slash floral shirts to, uh, that I've selected to go with each watch. This is just going to be a spectacular way. I can't wait for it. <laughs> Great. So let's kick straight into it then. Which, uh, which watch are you going to share with us first? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to share with you a watch that's been uh, buzzed about quite significantly in the last couple of days, and it is the Tudor Black Bay 58 Blue, Navy Blue as they call it. I think Navy is a sort of uh, nod to the whole idea of the blue snowflakes of mariners that were being used by the Marine National or the French Navy. Um, and, you know, the first thing that I remarked upon um, noticing this watch in the flesh was that the color of it, uh, oh, let me do a screen share with you, Ashley, forgive oh, me. Oh, yeah, please. Um, the color of it was so similar uh, to the Marine National uh, Watch Submariners. Um, Ross, in order for me to do a screen share, sir, you will have to allow me to. Oh, gosh, I've never had to uh, do this before. This might be, uh... how do I do that? Oh, more, hang on. Allow, hmm. Clean waiting room, allow record, no. Oh, I could make you the host. I think that would... Hmm. Sure. Okay, let me make you... Well, that stopped my recording there. Something's going to have to well, edit this out. It might stop recording it on your computer, but um, no, if it continues recording, let's let's see what happens. Okay, let's change host. Oh, yeah, now still you're... Recording. Yeah. So recording seems to still be working. Okay, fantastic. So now I'm going to do a screen share with you. And the, the watch I'm going to screen share with you is a new Tudor Black Bay 58, oh, yeah. 39 mm, 11.9 mm in, uh, in thickness. And I got to say, they really nailed the size on this watch. It's absolutely spectacular on the wrist. Mm -hmm. And you know, the thing that you and I were remarking on when we were discussing this watch earlier is that I love the fact that every year there's a sort of incremental increase in quality in the Tudor watches. And I have to say, when I put it on my wrist, you know, and I've got quite a few black bays. I've got the original one, I've got the bronze, I've got the dark. Um, I have to say, putting this watch on my wrist, I was just blown away by the quality. You know, I have to say, I'm not going to say it's the same quality as a Rolex, because I guess that would be impolitic. However, I would say it's rapidly approaching that. And it feels absolutely amazing on the wrist. When you close your eyes and you put this watch on, in the same way that when you put a Rolex on, you know you've got a great watch on. Um, yeah. So the other thing that's great about this watch is considering the price, which I believe is what, like 3000 700 US dollars on the bracelet and I recommend everyone get the bracelet because the bracelet kicks ass it's got the whole it looks like an old riveted bracelet uh, from the era of watches that we love but it's got all these sort of um, contemporary bells and trimmings on it including a beautiful clasp lops a lot uh, clasp locking system on there and uh, I have to say you know you look all over the finish of this watch and the thing that you remark on in particular is these incredible polished bevels on the lugs and over the side of the case which are so beautifully executed inside of the watch MT5402 uh, 
amazing movement, uh, full bridge as opposed to a balance cock, um, free sprung balance wheel, which means the inertia of the balance wheel is being adjusted by screws that are recessed into the rim, uh, and badass silicone hairspring, which is, uh, makes the watch impervious to the Stone forces button. of magnetism. So uh, I've got, I just got that this afternoon. I've been wearing it and I have to say I absolutely adore it. I've got one on. I've been playing around with uh, the Boulang and Sons distressed blue leather NATO. Fantastic. Yeah. It looks yeah. great on there. It looks great, doesn't it? It's a killer on that, man. That's yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I, I, we've talked about this, but for me, the 58 really, because it's based on the 1958 7924 Big Crown. Yeah, I think it, to have a big crown that you can wear every day and enjoy, and it's not going to cost you crazy money, um, I think is brilliant. Um, and it really does sit on the wrist so perfectly. The balance, the thirty-nine mil, the uh, shoulderless case without the crown guards, I, it's a winner. It, it, it's kind of almost this, this watch to me is faultless in terms of what it is and how they've presented it. Ross, if you were going to buy that watch, would you buy it on the NATO or would you buy it on the bracelet? For me personally, I'd buy it on the uh, fabric strap, the NATO style strap. Um, or, you know, I mean, Tudor used to give this fabric strap with the bracelet and now they don't. They kind of, it, it's one of the options. For me, yeah. blue snowflake on NATO strap is possibly my favorite ever kind of Killer. look for a watch, you know, particularly blue snowflake, you on a grey NATO and the old MN style look for me is getting close to being unbeatable. Well, you know, I think that's the thing that's cool about what they're offering. They're offering uh, for you to be able to purchase it on the fabric strap or on the bracelet. Um, what's impressive to me, at least, was that the premium for the bracelet is not that significantly more as well. So if you are a bracelet guy, uh, it's kind of good to go with that. But I also respect the fact that you can buy it directly on the fabric um, strap as well, because a lot, let's face it, the majority of guys are going to wear it that way, because it gives you that even kind of kind of cooler vintage look and also gives you the possibility to personalize it as well with any strap that you want, right? Uh, absolutely and i think what has really really amazed me I, mean, I remember the original 58 in 2018 was a massive like smash i think the blue maybe even more so and i've spoken to so many kind of big dealers and collectors of very high-end rolex and patek who are actually buying these uh, and they're going to use them all summer on the beach on their boats all that kind of thing you know, the amazing thing about this watch is as soon as I put it on, I, I actually genuinely don't want to take it off. Um, and, you know, I love that in, in 2018 when they launched the original 58, it had so many of the codes uh, of the 7924 that we love, as you were mentioning, but also of the only watch watch, which they had created way back yeah. in the day. Of you course. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was a great watch. Out. Yeah, with the gilt writing on it, with the red triangle for the, uh, the pearl at 12 o'clock on the bezel. I mean, it was... Uh, yeah. It's, it's just got all the, bait, the the great vintage codes, but then can you, if you can contrast that with a, a movement that's got a silicone hairspring in there, you know, um, you're getting kind of the best of both possible worlds. So it's it's kind of like I don't want to say it's like a Singer Porsche, but I mean it's it's a, it's an interesting analogy because it's got the vintage style, but it's got all the modern function too. You know, yeah, that's actually a very very good analogy. Yeah, um, yeah. I like but at also an accessible price point, which is yeah. which unlike, is unlike a Singer Porsche. <laughs> exactly. Now, Ross, let me ask you this, because, um, you know, I, I love Tudors, and, and when they first came out, you know, you could get them, um, but now I see the market is completely wiped out of them. It seems like they're, they're now as desirable and as hard to get as uh, steel um, Rolex sports models. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Black Bay 58 was maybe the kind of ultimate moment for Tudor to enter into waiting list in grey market uh, over listing. I mean, there are special edition watches that they've done, the Harrods, uh, the Chrono Dark, which are very, very limited and therefore command a premium. But for Tudor to have a series produced watch that is a, a waiting list is, is incredible. Um, it, I think it started with the, the GMT initially, was uh, there was a yeah. big waiting list for that. Uh, right. But certainly the 58 is a very difficult watch to track down. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, guys, you know, we're, we're best of luck to you guys for your summer hunting. Um, and uh, yeah, if you manage to get one on your wrist, it's worthwhile, man. All right. I think it's possibly the greatest buy of the year. Yeah, I'm blown away by the, the price. Uh, 
um, to quality, you know, ratio is just extraordinary. Now, now, Ross, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, different series of watches. Now, I know a lot of people are interested in vintage. A lot of people are interested in contemporary watches. But I like to talk a little to you about about the watches that straddle the middle ground. And these are watches that I kind of think about as contemporary collectible, uh, modern vintage, for lack of a better term. And to me, these are kind of the watches from you know, like up until 1987, Rolex. Um, they numbered all their watches with uh, sequential serial numbers. Yeah. And then 1987 to 2009, if I'm not mistaken, they started to put the prefix of um, the uh, alphabets. Initially, they just used the alphabets of Rolex, but omitting the O because it looked like a zero, right? Yep. So yep. They, they are, you know, um, L, uh, E, X, and all that kind of thing. Um, and then they went all the way through, I believe, the last of the um, alphabetical prefixes, which was in 2009, that was the G series. Um, and then uh, in 08, it was the V. In 07, it was the M. So um, I... I've been really focused on this era of Rolex as well, because I think these contemporary collectibles are kind of a little bit undervalued. Um, and, and okay, I, after we saw the price of the Kermit that went, you know, that went for a, a, a fortune at, at the Phillips auction yeah. in Geneva, I don't know if they are anymore, but I think within there still, there's been some that have moved really rapidly and there's some that are still a little bit understated in terms of value. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about those watches, but if you don't mind, uh, first, I have to change into another shirt to match my watch. Ross, I'm back. How are wow. you? And I'm wearing an unconventional shirt. So that first shirt I was I was wearing was an actual vintage Hawaiian shirt. I bought it in Le Pousse, which is the, the French uh, flea market. The, it's out in Paris. Um, and uh, and, and what, what was the name of that shop? It'll come to me. But it was this really cool shop full with these kind of rock and roll dudes that have got tons of cool vintage, shop, uh, vintage stuff in there. Uh, cool. They've got an amazing array of Hawaiian shirts. Um, then uh, this shirt is uh, from a Japanese brand called Wako Maria, and I like it because it's a black Hawaiian shirt, and I wanted to wear it because I've got a black dial watch to talk to you about. So we Amazing. talked about contemporary collectible. Uh, so let, let's start in the year of 1988. This is an interesting year because this is the year that um, we saw the, the launch of the Rolex Daytona in automatic format for the first time. Uh, using the Zenith El Primero movement, uh, detuned to 28,800 vibrations or four hertz, as opposed to 36,000 vibrations or five hertz. Um, and this was the watch that started the whole waiting list craze, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, uh, sir? That's correct, yeah, yeah. And one of my favorites, one of my favorites. So I guess uh, you can see here that it's got uh, a few differences from what you would think about in most of the, uh, the Daytonas. First, you see that the, the, tur the word cosmograph is detached or spaced, or it's floating away from the other lines of text. So I guess that they call that a floating cosmograph. Mm -hmm. uh, you see here that the six in the hour counter is inverted, so it's an inverted six. And you see also here that the bezel is demarcated in terms of units per hour, uh, and instead of, uh, what is the normal uh, demarcation for uh, the 300, bezel? 300, 300. Uh, no, 500, the, uh, sorry. 500, no, no, no. So here you 500, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got 200 instead. Uh, and what else is interesting, I guess it's that you see here that it's in the steel watch, the, the center links were, were brushed and not polished, you see in the more uh, modern watches. Um, it, it also, just the whole format of these watches, the, the, the Zenith watches are, are quite easy to recognize. The way I always do it is when you look at the three o'clock and nine o'clock indexes, they, they are in the same horizontal line as the opinions of the um, continuous seconds and minute counter of mm -hmm. the chronograph. Right. Whereas when, you know, Rolex went to its in-house movements, those two pinions are slightly elevated off of the mm -hmm. horizontal uh, line. But I have to say, I bought this watch before um, people started paying attention to them. I bought it back in, uh, let's say, uh, 2012, 2013. And I bought okay. it for about 12,000 U.S. dollars, 13,000 U.S. dollars. Wow. And they, they've recently kind of gone up quite significantly in value. So I, it was a good buy, I suppose. It was an inadvertent buy, um, uh, but it, it's great. And I, I know it's one of the just most charming watches uh, to wear. Uh, it functions perfectly as a chronograph. Um, it, it works you know, beautifully. Of course, that movement is an incredible. Um, laterally coupled column wheel automatic chronograph, the first integrated automatic luxury Swiss chronograph movement, um, uh, which was born in 1969, which was incidentally the same era I was um, born in, so it has that kind of significance. But also, I, it reminds me of 1988, which was the first year that I went to university. Uh, and all the kind of wonderful uh, memories I have of that time. Um, and I remember when I was in a uh, freshman in university and this watch came out, I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I said, you know, one day 
I'd love to have that. Um, there were yeah. two things that I always wanted from that era. One was this watch and one was a Porsche 930 Turbo. Oh yeah, very nice. And, and then when I was, uh, um, when I first moved to Los Angeles before they went for crazy money, I managed to buy a 930 Turbo, a 1979 930 Turbo four speed. Um, and I have to say the relationship with that car and the relationship with this watch are two very different relationships. The relationship with this watch has always been one where it's always tried to reward and support me. And the relationship with the Porsche was, was a relationship where it tried to kill me every time I got into it. Right. Like it was, it was an incredible car. First of all, it was so hot in there. Right. So it was, it's yeah. a, what do you call it? An air cooled car. So in Los Angeles sitting in traffic, because traffic is terrible there, it would start to overheat, so I'd have to shut it down anyway. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I tried to turn on the air conditioning, but it, it literally felt like an old man was breathing hot breath onto me. You know, it's just like, Bleh. and uh, and then <laughs> until I would arrive at work, uh, like drenched in sweat, I stupidly opted to have like a, um, a racing clutch put on it, so it was so heavy. So mm -hmm. I would have like rigor mortis in my left leg. Um, I'd be drenched in sweat from overheating inside of the car. Um, yeah. Super stressed, uh, but but um, it was fun. And then, of course, the dynamics of the car itself. It was one of the first turbo um, engines uh, for you know uh, commercial sports cars, and it had turbo lag. So that meant you would put your foot down on the accelerator, and nothing would happen for about two seconds. And then it would feel like Thor, the Norse god of thunder, had hit you in the ass with his hammer. And you just go hurtling forward, but in the most uncontrollable and dangerous way possible. Right? Yeah. And this would invariably always happen on an, like, uh, a, a highway off-ramp or on-ramp. <laughs> and the thing with those cars um, is that you, no matter what you do, you can't take your foot off the accelerator in a turn. And, of course, your instinct would immediately tell you to take your foot off the accelerator. And there were one more than one occasion where I ended up facing completely the wrong direction um, wow. to my chagrin and embarrassment. So uh, there you go. Two different relationships with two yeah, very yeah. beautiful mechanical <laughs> objects, one yeah. of which I still have, one which I don't, thankfully. Um, okay, so, Ross, if you don't mind, and sorry for, for, for talking so much, but uh, I'm going to now jump uh, to another watch, which means, if you don't mind, I'm going to pause the recording, and I'm going to put on another shirt. So Ross, how are you, sir? I'm back. Um, now I'm wearing, uh, this is probably one of my all-time favorite Hawaiian shirts, if you can call it a Hawaiian shirt. Uh, first of all, the material is Japanese viscose. It's, it's fantastic fabric, and it feels really cool against the skin. The problem with silk Hawaiian shirts is that they are very warm, unfortunately. So yeah. I would say rayon and viscose would be kind of like the best materials for them. Uh, this is made by um, a company called Real McCoys, which makes a really amazing Japanese kind of a heritage military and streetwear. Um, and I'm, the predominant colors on this are red and black, and that's because I have a watch that is red and black and themed. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share a picture of that watch with you. First, I'll give you a kind of a master shot of it, and then I'm going to yep. do a close up for you as well. So the master Ooh. shot, and again, I, I should have apologized beforehand for my horrible photography skills, but, but anyway, there you go. Oh, so what is it? Well, it's one of the watches that we know the best. It's a Rolex GMT Master II, uh, but it's an interesting one. So as we were talking about the alphabetical prefixes for watches between 1987 and 2009, this watch is an M series. So I believe the M series comes from 2007. Uh, and it was interesting because as you can see, this is an aluminum bezel watch and it's uh, the last of the aluminum bezel GMTs before they moved over to the ceramic bezel. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting about this is in the late Z and, and throughout the entire M series of these watches, they actually put the new movement, the movement from the ceramic watch, the caliber 3186 in, yeah. in these aluminum bezel watches. So they're kind of like a bit of a interesting hybrid. And one of those, you know, I, we always find it really interesting when Rolex kind of does things in a weird almost like accidental way. And those to me ended up being come, coming the most collectible watches. Now, what's interesting about these watches is that they have two types of dials, which are quite unique from the standard GMT uh, Master II dial, right? So it, it can either come as a stick dial where you have the two from GMT Master II, just as two basically sticks, or you can have what this dial is, which is, I will show you now. Uh, if you look here, it looks almost like a little rectangle, right? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's kind of cool as well. So I, I actually get this watch um, back in 2011, I think. Mm -hmm. I bought it from a really cool guy who's kind of quite big on the, the pre-owned vintage, uh, and well, I would say primarily pre-owned vintage uh, Rolex scene, David SW. I don't know if you heard of him, but yeah, really, yeah, yeah. really good dude. 
Um, very nice person, very knowledgeable person. Also been a great community galvanizer. I know he kind of helps to support um, your watch crew, for example. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so you can see here that this has got that kind of rectangular um, uh, yep. demarcation for the two. And mm -hmm. then it's a Coke because I just find the Coke, which means the red and black bezel, as opposed to the, the blue and red bezel to, mm -hmm. to show which are day, daylight hours and which are night hours uh, yep. in the 24 hour bezel. I just think it's kind of cool. I wear a lot of black, and so I, I, I coke kind of naturally uh, yeah. appealed to me. I know I, I think they're probably a little less common than um, Pepsi bezels. I also know that a lot of people buy bezels and swap them around anyway. But this one came originally with a coke bezel, and I like that. And I know one of the biggest speculations that everyone has had is is uh, what's what's Rolex going to come out with? Are they going to come out with a coke? Um, I don't know. I guess we'll find out soon. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I, I, there's uh, there's things afoot from from what we know, but yeah, yeah. it's a dope watch. Now, from a um, uh, investment perspective, it's interesting also because I still think there's room to go on these watches a little bit. Like, um, I remember I picked mine up for about six grand back in 2011, mm -hmm. and now here we are, almost um, a decade later, and they're pretty expensive. You know, they're about eighteen thousand US dollars. Yeah. But to me, still, you know, considering how interesting they are and how unique they are, I think they still might have a bit more room to go. I think that even though the collector community knows about them, like not maybe, you know, they're not as, as commonly um, known or acknowledged uh, in, by, by a wider audience, but that, that could change, right? You know, yeah. um, and, and I think that if you like GMTs and if you're looking for a modern one, you can wear all day long. Um, and, and not even worry about and be on a desert island, um, but still have something very unique about it. Yeah. I think that watch is cool. Yeah. Don't forget also that the 3186 um, has a parachrome hairspring, whereas the previous generation of those movements don't. Yeah. So um, the easiest way to be sure is just bring it to your service center and have them open up the case back. But if you don't want to do that or it's not practical for you to do that, you can do what people call the wiggle test. And the wiggle test basically means that um, when you're uh, switching – the hour hand on the GMT function, right? What happens yep. is in the movement previous to this, the the large second time zone hand would wiggle every time you switched it. Yeah. And in this, in the three one eight six, it doesn't wiggle or it does, but barely perceptibly. So that that's one way to to, to know. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, pretty much any M series should have that that movement in. So there we go. Uh, I've got two more watches to show you, but in order to do that, I'm going to have to change my shirt again. So so we're back, Ross. Wow, Ross! I, I, I've never. I meant to ask you, where's your shirt from? Mrs. Povey bought this for me. I don't know actually. Probably Marks and Spencer's or somewhere like that. Just a, really a classic. Cool. I like the uh, hibiscusy flowers. I find them very. Yeah, yeah. I uh, think you know. I think this. I think this is uh, viscose as well. Going back to yeah, what I I'm saying, really, it's a very. I, I enjoy wearing it. Yeah, it's a it's a great. I, you know, I'm just I'm just gonna be wearing these kind of shirts all summer. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's a new thing. I'm not a Hawaiian shirt um, expert. I'm a novice. So this is my introduction to it. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very happy, very comfortable in it. Now, now tell me a little bit um, about Mrs. Povey because she's an amazing singer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She's, uh, yeah, a very, very, very talented singer. Um, she is working as a singing teacher as well and has sung all around the world doing all kinds of things over the years and uh, yeah she's uh, currently been singing for lockdown to raise money for the nhs um, oh that's amazing yeah that's great. yeah it's been good really good yeah very positive oh, response cool. to it well that's cool that you both are both so sort of uh so charitable minded uh you know i, I just hope people know here uh, that um that you were it was basically your idea to 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 create this um, COVID solidarity option, which we did, which we raised two hundred eighty thousand dollars for, and and we're in the process of dispersing the funds to the various different charities as well. Um, I know that we're going to do it for five different parts of the world, um, and uh, and and to the charities that we've selected that we feel will best use the, these funds. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's cool, man. But you know, you know, great job on that, and you know, and thanks for being an inspiring, dude. Thank you. No, it was it was amazing. I, the the response to it was so much more than I think any of us ever imagined to uh, get the brands on board in the way that we did and to raise that amazing amount of money was just uh, very incredible. Yeah, yeah. There, there were just um, the I have to say the brands really came through for us. They were so cool about it. Um, yeah. Gave such beautiful watches to us. So, some watches with real sort of like um, you know the, the watch that Ryan Reynolds wore and you know Six Underground yeah. or. Yeah. George Kern's personal watch, or to have these PS Uniques created for us by Tag, or yeah. by Giro Pergo, and to have that incredible watch um, by Van Cleef and Arpels with the, 
you know, the miniature um, uh, wow. painting in enamel. Yeah, it was, that was a great right. watch. Yeah, killer. Well, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I guess the prevailing theme of that watch was kind of a green theme because it was a, uh, uh, a four-leaf clover watch. So I've got some green, you know, vegetation on my shirt today. Uh, the watch I'm going to show you is, however, not green in color. It's black and steel in color, similar to the background of this uh, shirt. And it is, I guess, one of the most famous diving watches of all time. It is the Rolex Sea Dweller. So I'll just uh, do a screen share of the image uh, right here. And there we go. So that's a uh, Sea Dweller. That's the V series. Um, this was, you know, in 2008, and I just found out that um, they were going to uh, discontinue the Sea Dweller, right? Um, and of course, you know, Rolex being cryptic as they do, they, they discontinue things, but they never tell you if they're going to, you know, reintroduce them later. And they did reintroduce the Sea Dweller a few years later. But yeah. at the time, everyone was like, oh, I can't believe they're, they're, uh, they're going to discontinue the Sea Dweller. It, it's always been one of my favorite watches. I think the lore of the Sea Dweller, its association with Comex, uh, the while of the creation of the helium release valve to let helium molecules have been built up at pressure under uh, yeah. and deep saturation diving, has been really cool. But it's just from it's one of those watches you put on your wrist and it just makes you feel heroic, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this it's is a lot. Go. So it's a true tool watch, isn't it? I mean, it really is the business, the Sea Dweller. It's make no mistakes about this watch. This can take you to the depths. It can accompany you on pretty much any adventure that you would choose to um, set out on. You know, it's it's probably too much watch for me. You know, uh, I I who um you know I I can kind of dog paddle. You know, I'm one of those guys that uh, when I'm on vacation, I like to swim with my head above the 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 pool. Uh, so I can work, keep my sunglasses on and, and drink my daiquiri or pina colada uh, or my Negroni. But yeah. it's, it's a great watch. Um, again, 4,000 uh, feet or, you know, 1,220 meters uh, water resistance is nuts. Mm. Um, it, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a badass, bristling, manly watch, a real tool watch. And, and this is the thing that I, I've always dug on these watches is that if you press the little circle that's inside of here, right, it releases the additional link. Uh, so that's the can, link. Yeah, yeah. You can put that now over your wetsuit, which is like, dude, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's pretty full on. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it makes no apologies for being, um, to use your phrase, seriously badass because, you know, the Sea Dweller was not made for, for the pool or for the party scene. It was made for professional divers to really take that watch down and, and test it to its limits. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I absolutely love mine. And then incidentally, if anyone's interested in this shirt, it is made by um, a bunch of Italian guys, uh, two Italian brothers, actually, Sebastiano and Sergio Guardi. And they've got an amazing brand called Barbanera. Barbanera means Blackbeard um, in Italian. And it's, it was a brand that was uh, inspired by the pirate Blackbeard, who was both a dandy and an adventurer. He used to uh, put fuses like uh pistol fuses in his beard and set them on uh, on fire just make himself look even crazier when he would jump on board ships to scare uh, uh civilians and, and uh, wow. i guess you know, maybe i should try that for my next visit to the <laughs> island yeah exactly yeah I, I, that's a good thing at least as we haven't been uh, attacked by pirates so far you know so. yeah yeah well that's but, but kind I, of why i brought wilson along now because i felt yes. like you know We've, we've invited a lot of people to the island and security is always a concern. So Wilson's going to be on lookout for me now in the future. He's, yeah, he's there to terrify people, I can imagine, with his horrible crimson visage. Yeah. Um, but, but I, you know, that kind of brings to mind um, the last watch, which I brought along as well, which is, okay, what if we end up in a situation where we need to raise a significant amount of money as a ransom. Say they kidnap us or a whole bunch of us and they're holding us ransom and we need to, we need to get ourselves out of there and back to safety and civilization. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I've got a watch for that. And if you give me a second, I'm gonna put on a shirt that may give you a clue as to what that may be. And now we're back, Ross. And, and Ross, you know, we were talking about watches that would be useful in a, in a ransom situation should we be yeah. um, attacked by pirates, for example. Uh, and I guess the watch that might help us out of a sticky situation like that would be uh this one let me see if i can pull up the picture for us yeah let's see stupidly it's possible to, uh that i nope <laughs> i pretty much download the picture of everything else except for this so i'm just going to hold it up to the screen <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry wow Boom. well that's a, a 6241 paul newman daytona 
Wow. Uh, and I want to preface this by saying that I, this is a watch I bought many, many years ago, back when where they weren't crazy money. Um, that is so incredibly nice. It, yeah, it's you know your classic sort of cream center <laughs> dial with the you know the mm -hmm. red uh, and black um, seconds slide. Oh, sorry, minute track. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's a seconds track too. You use the chronograph seconds hand on it, but yeah, it's 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 a great watch. And I, you know, I used to wear it all the time, um, just because it was just a, it was a watch I always wanted. Another one of those watches that, like, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. I started you know looking at Japanese magazines or Italian magazines and seeing them yeah. appear in there for the first time. I was like, it's just so cool looking, you know? Yeah, um, so nice. Thank you, man. Uh, but yeah, I figure uh, now that they're they're kind of going up in value, if we need to be rescued from something. Um, yeah. Perhaps we can we can use that watch. Um, we needed to raise capital to to build on the island. Either absolutely, way. It's absolutely. Useful. We need a bar, and uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, we can swap. Yeah, we can swap it for a case of uh, champagne uh, as, exactly. as part of the contra deal with uh, whoever we're dealing with. I love that. You know, and I would just like to mention that I say this sometimes, uh, you know, in jest, but I actually honestly do mean it, that if, if I were in any situation where I knew I had to 100% rely on my watch, and I'm saying outside of something where I'm going to put on like a G-Shop or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I'd probably want to have a Rolex on my wrist because they are um, from a, a qualitative perspective, from an engineering perspective, from a functional and reliability perspective, there's nothing that touches it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I joke about like smashing open a coconut with it, but if you wanted to, you you totally could. You could bust open camshells, you yeah. could tie your watch to a string and, and you could like hopefully get fish to bite on it and you could reel them in and yeah. that thing would still keep immaculate time. So yeah. there is now, because of the cult of collectability of vintage Rolex watches, you know, a perception that they're these sort of like, you know, hallowed um, grails. And of course they are. I mean, they're beautiful watches, mm -hmm. but they were created first and foremost to be tools and to be, you know, like that sea dweller that we were talking about, like watches that people could rely upon in the most sort of, uh, of, of inclement sort of situations. I mean, mm -hmm. bearing in mind also that um, a similar model, the Submariner, was chosen by um, many of the British elite forces yep. To, yep. as their watch that they would wear every day on their wrist you know a 55 104 14 uh um uh, you know mill sub for example uh, was a watch that people would depend on with, for their lives and i think that's that's uh there's not many brands that could say that of course there's a few other brands that have inc incredible histories incredible lores as well mm -hmm. but i think rolex is quite extraordinary in that yeah definitely and th they are watches built for a purpose you know the chronographs the diving watches the gmt master even the explorers heritage in being the watches that uh, were worn during the successful ascent of uh, everest by hillary and and and, and his crew have, has now led to this watch that's become you know the 369 dial completely iconic in every way and so yeah i think for me the rolex tool story is maybe one of the most kind of enduring and fascinating in the horological kind of you know cosmos yeah you know ross if, if you were like a, a young guy and just kind of getting into um rolexes or tutors what what would you recommend for someone to to, to look at in terms of a, an accessible piece but one that's going to you know um hold its value and going to give you tons of like enjoyment from a wearing perspective i think the uh, looking at the watches that you've been focusing on today those kind of um late 80s early 90s sapphire watches a great value and um, the no date sub the 14060 is still you know accessible ish certainly the first yeah. sapphire explorer the uh, 14 um 270 a great watch and a lot of heritage to that watch so a little bit smaller it's 36 mil but it's got the 20 mil lug so it's still got that sporty um sporty elegance but i think for me one of the most interesting elements of the rolex sports watches is how they can easily kind of move between different scenarios so yeah they're great for the sporty thing they're also great with a a suit they're great at a party at a bar just for whatever you want to do for work under under your business suit as well you know it, it's a watch really that can do anything that's and amazing that's testament to the incredible you know, design of these watches that they are so transferable between every kind of element of your life. Totally agree. Um, you know, and you were mentioning that no date sub um, with a sapphire uh, uh, crystal. Mm. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the they came in both tritium versions and, and luminova versions as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
and drilled and non-drilled lugs as well. Yes. So, so I guess probably from a kind of collectible point of view, the drilled lugs, tritium watches, yes. are maybe from a collector's point of view, the most interesting. Um, yeah, they're cool. But, but then there's the transitional model with Swiss only at the bottom uh, yes. and moved to Swiss made. So it's like anything, isn't it? You know, for many, many years, it was just a 14060. But as collectors move their collect foci onto these different references people start to then pull apart the the, the iterations and the versions that were presented so for example a great uh, illustration of this is the zenith movement daytona and everybody thinks that you know well everybody knows there are the different dial variations bezel variations the watch that came after that the double one five six twenty for many years nobody really paid much attention to that now I've noticed that people are starting to break that down into the various versions. Um, Actually, you're right. You know, that's funny because like every, no one was at all focused on it. And it was funny because I remember when we first started having the conversation about Zenith um, Daytona's, I think it was pretty much like immediately after um, Orel's um, auction for the Paul Newman, Paul Newman, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and everyone was like, yeah, it's going to be the Zenith watches that, that start to, to ascend next, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And yeah. you saw that happen so rapidly. And it's a very organic shift in terms of people's focus or a broadening of focus because I think they're still interested in the 6263s, 6265s, um, 6239s, and 6241s, and the 6240 transitional models as well. But like uh, for me, like I guess no one was really paying attention to those that first generation of in-house movement um, uh, Daytonas. And you're totally right. There is a great deal of nuance actually in those watches as well. Mm -hmm. and, and some of them have really, really attractive subdials as well that, you know, they're, they're like, I had one which has been co-opted by another family member of mine uh, <laughs> who, who and, and everyone initially would think it's a Patrizzi dial watch because it, the subdials were just a slightly different color. Yeah. And I, I, was, I would like to identify what series those were because they're very attractive, actually. Yeah. Well, um, we're, we're seeing that in um, P and early K, so 2000, uh, 2001. The white yes. dials are changing. So I've just done a Povey's picks for Christie's this coming weekend. And what I've done is I've picked three um, double one six five twenties, a white one, a cream one, and then one that's turned what Sotheby's have called citrus yellow. And so yes. in, in those, so that there's one. Then later on, um, around 2013 14, there's what collectors now call the APH. Now nobody knew and thought nobody noticed this, but there's a, a a subtle but very noticeable gap between the R and the A of Cosmograph, and that gap leaves the APH at the end. And detached and so that's now the APH dial we saw one wow. at Phillips a couple yes of years ago for crazy money um, that's amazing because wow. of this collector's reference and the Italians already have started breaking them down I think they're up to nine different variations of the double one twenty <laughs> dial now um, I'm gonna look at that watch that's been co-opted by my family member yeah yeah that. you need to see what it is is it, is it an APH is it a, a color oh, you know I'll just take the dial off of it and put put, a, put another one back in <laughs> um, yeah you know for me also and I and I don't say this just because I bought one of these and because we have a good relationship with them but honestly if you're looking for a modern watch, um, go go try on a Tudor uh, Black Bay 58. Um, it's it's just killer, and and for yeah. for the money, yeah. for that movement, for mm -hmm. what it means in terms of that, you know, in-house movement, um, automatic movement, full bridge, um, free sprung balance wheel, you know, micro stellar um, adjusters on the balance wheel, mm -hmm. freaking silicon hairspring, um, for uh, the size and dimension of the watch, for the quality of the finish of it, for just that it's iconic styling. Just the styling, it's, yeah, stunning. You can't go wrong, man. You know, you, no, you, can't. Wrong, man. you really can't go wrong. No, it's 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 just the greatest watch. I love it. They've done a great it's job. Awesome. Ross, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, let me toast to you. Cheers, Ryan. Ben Wilson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, talking about. Um, Cracking open some clams. I did that before. They've been um, they've been um, resting nicely for us. So maybe we could throw those on the barbie and um, have a chat about the best way forward with that six two four one Newman. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I've been reading up also on how to ferment uh, coconut uh, uh, milk into uh, alcohol. So we might yeah. have uh, ourselves. An we'll, we'll be rolling. We'll be rocking and rolling after that. Exactly. Thanks, Ross. Good to see Thanks, you, my Ray. friend. See you Take soon. Care, Cheers.